G'day. Well, today I want to talk about the difficulties of mission. In 253 AD, a 40-year-old Christian lawyer named Gregory was consecrated as Bishop of Neo-Caesarea, a town in northeastern Turkey near the Black Sea, about 430 kilometres from modern Ankara. Uh, he had a congregation of 17. 13 years later, when he retired, there were only 17 people in the diocese who were not yet baptised. He's called Gregory Thaumaturgos, Gregory the Wonder Worker, for good reason. Although he's one of the few bishops of the period who left fairly comprehensive records, uh, a lot of detail of his ministry is sketchy. Uh, they say he stopped a raging flooded river, drained a lake to solve a dispute, and drove demons out of a pagan temple. Uh, but we do know he never lost sight of the goal of winning converts, and that clearly paid dividends. When we hear of St Peter or Gregory Thaumaturgus or other famous preachers, don't we think, oh, I wish I could be like that? How exciting to win people every day, to perform miracles and to boldly tell the amazed people about Jesus. How great it would be, how blessed I would have to be to have so much good happening all the time. But sometimes mission fails. Our good deeds backfire, what we do for others leads to our suffering and we even wonder where God is in all these things. Our passage is about just such a situation. In Acts chapter 16, verses 16 to 34, we read, One day as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune-telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days, but Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, These men are disturbing our city, they are Jews and they are advocating customs that are not lawful for us Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them into the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was an earthquake, so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, "'Don't harm yourself!' For we're all here. The jailer called for lights and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds then he and his entire family were baptised without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. The first phase of this story is about the slave girl, but there were problems with this slave girl. Whenever she saw them, she taunted them. 
Paul and Silas had met Lydia down by the riverside in Philippi and she was converted. A small congregation gathered in her home and ministry was good. But then came this girl shouting, These men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. The Bible uses an unusual term for the evil spirit driving this girl. It's called a python spirit. This refers to the Delphic oracle in Greece. According to legend, a giant snake once lived in Delphi and when the god Apollos took over the site, he killed it with a hundred arrows. So the term python became associated with the Delphic Oracle and this girl had the same kind of spirit as the Delphic Oracle. Now the Delphic priestess used to squat over a fissure in the rocks where hot gases rose up. She went into a trance from these vapours and didn't always even make sense. You can work it out. This girl's owners drugged her into a trance to access this spirit and she gave these predictions to all who paid. Imagine the damage it did to her. So Paul was increasingly irritated by this constant mockery and bullying and that irritation drove him to tackle the root problem. He dealt with what these trances are causing her to do. He spoke to the spirit and drove it out. At once she was delivered. That's powerful ministry. But see what happened next. It says, when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They're Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us Romans to adopt or observe. Bold ministry provokes extreme reactions. The healing was certainly good for this young woman but not at all good for her owners. They couldn't make money from her anymore. When anyone tells you something is good, you should always ask, good for whom? A famous book of the 1970s was Ian McHarg's Design with Nature. It had a lot of good ideas, and one example he gave was of planning a highway route that avoided old-growth forest, didn't involve major cut and fill, prevented runoff into waterways, and only demolished the oldest, cheapest housing. Hang on, though. Where do poor people live? It was a good design, as long as you weren't poor and black. It was good for this slave girl not to be going into a trance, maybe drugged sometimes several times a day, but it was no good for her owners and the money they made from her. It was no good for the people who liked the entertainment either. And you'll notice that just as Jesus' opponents accused him of a religious crime before the Sanhedrin, but of a political crime before Pilate, these slave owners didn't accuse Paul and Silas of ruining their business, but of being racially and culturally wrong. They were Jews advocating foreign traditions. That was enough to get them offside with the magistrate. There was no law against being Jewish, but Jews were unpopular. There was no law against believing in Jesus, but you shouldn't disturb the status quo. So straight after the victory of delivering this girl from her misery, Paul and Silas were thrown into misery. The Bible says that the crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they'd given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, the, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. Instead of bringing about a great turning to Jesus, the actions of Paul and Silas made them social outcasts, brought them shame, they were stripped naked, and the Greeks thought circumcision was mutilation and mocked Jewish men because of it. They were humiliated, physically in injured them, they were severely beaten with flexible canes that tore away strips of skin and muscle and deprived them of their liberty. They were chained in stocks in the innermost dungeon room. They weren't even given a trial. The last part of the story is the unexpected outcome. Paul and Silas had no knowledge of what this downturn would mean. 
The worst place in a prison was the innermost dungeon. There was no light unless someone brought it. There was no relief from pain. There was no wound cleaning and no one driving away flies and cockroaches. They were in agony from their beating and ached from the stocks. They couldn't even move to be less uncomfortable. It was a horrible situation and one of the lowest in Paul's experience. There was only one thing to do. At one time, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and told them, in all things give thanks. He didn't say, for all things give thanks. It was, in all things give thanks. So Paul and Silas didn't say, Lord, we thank you for the beating. Lord, we thank you for the humiliation. Lord, we thank you for the pain right now. But they probably said something like, Lord, we praise you because you've considered us worthy to share in your own sufferings. We thank you that we're bound for glory no matter what we suffer in the flesh. We praise you because you are the ruler of the universe and your kingdom will one day rule over all who do evil. There is power in praying and praising that way. A woman's son was into drugs, casual sex and petty crime. She kept trying to talk to him about Jesus and about how he needed to clean up his life, but he just refused to listen. Then she read that verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and didn't stop praying for her son, but began giving thanks for him too. She thanked God that her son was still alive. She valued his compassion toward his friends and she thanked God for how he would transform her son. As she prayed that way, she began talking to her son differently, affirming the good and not just dwelling on the problems. She became less judgmental and saw him as a person created in God's image who was still to reach his potential. One day he realised God isn't judgmental and began seeing the love poured out in Jesus. This was the kind of praying Paul and Silas were doing in prison. And suddenly there was an earthquake. It must have been a big one because parts of the prison were seriously damaged. The jailer was sure he'd lost his prisoners and the Romans didn't take earthquakes as an excuse. Better to die quickly at his own hand than to let the Romans flog him and maybe crucify him. And here's the thing, God was probably working out a great many things as Paul and Silas offered themselves to be used however he wanted. Maybe some of the crowd saw the cruelty of the punishment and had compassion. Maybe some wanted to know more about a message which could deliver a demonised woman. Or maybe the soldiers who took them to the prison saw something of Jesus in the two victims. But the one thing we can be sure of is that God had also placed Paul and Silas exactly where they needed to be when that jailer was so desperate that he was about to commit suicide. He cried out, how can I be saved? And Paul and Silas knew he was already safe from the Romans because he had lost none of his prisoners, but they told him about an even greater salvation. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved you and your household. That very night, as the walls of the prison still shook from aftershocks, the jailer believed and was baptised and began to change as he ministered to Paul and Silas instead of treating them as the scum of the earth. When they were needed, God already had them there. We sometimes get a glowing picture of being in mission, and I suspect that a lot of Christians are put off even trying because they tried once, everything seemed to go wrong, and they gave up. I had a friend who was an evangelist, and he laboured for nine years in a divided church without winning a single person to Christ. It was enormously frustrating work for him, and he was ready to give up. What he didn't realise was that God had used him to heal a century-old division get leadership based on, on competence rather than family tradition and released six or seven people into ministries of their own. Ministry and mission isn't about exciting events and, and vast numbers, but about hanging in there so you can be there when you need it. It's about bringing healing and deliverance to one hurting person about being available when a desperate man cries out, how can I be saved? About facing hardship for the sake of our Saviour. 
Few of us are likely to be beaten for our witness, but all of us need to be willing to face mission difficulties and keep going for Christ. Let's determine to do just that. Amen. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe using the button below.